Awesome. But with that, perhaps you can start by just giving a quick introduction about your background as well. Uh, how how <clears> would you describe yourself? Uh, yes, uh, a man in his best years, having mm. worked 20 something years professionally in, in uh, software engineering, machine learning and natural language processing. <clears throat> Started out as a computer science student, turned computational linguists uh, in the 90s and did my master's and my licentiate thesis. I'm not sure the English is the English word is for that in, in Uppsala uh, and did my PhD in Gothenburg uh, on active learning, actually, for, for yeah. named entity recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, some 12 We need to years. explore that one. Yeah. I mean, I mean, let's OK, let's also uncouple that a bit for people that yeah. don't know what active learning or named entity recognition is. But in short, you can say it's some kind of computational linguistic or how, yes. how do you describe the field in general? Yes, uh, everything having to do with transforming or using human language, uh, particularly written language, because, uh, well, uh, let's go back to that later on, but written language text uh, by using computers. Mm -hmm. Essentially, so there are actually there are nuances here as well. I was a language technology student, which is more applied than computational linguistics, which is perhaps more from the linguistic side, where you you have your ideas and theories and you try to assess them or, or, or discard them by by using computers. And then just to <coughs> if we go with name entity recognition to start with, how, how would you describe that? Uh, well, uh, mentions in text of things and entities in, in the world, for instance, um, Anders Arpteg of Peltarion, mm. there is a reference to you and to the company that you work with. Mm. Uh, so the, the things, the ways that we can express those kinds of links in text uh, are, are you know, numerous and they might use, be useful if you're building like a knowledge graph, for instance to see how people or Don't companies... There, uh, I can see you're <coughs> jumping yeah. into that one, but <laughs> wait for that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, so that's the way of, of, uh, of getting to specific por uh, portions of information and in text that you believe are important. But, but <coughs> you as, uh, as well as me, uh, you know, have, I worked with NLP uh, far before uh, deep learning became mm. popular and, and revolutionized, you know, how we can work with text um, and, and all these kind of traditional techniques like, you know, stemming mm. or... Mm co-reference resolutions or, mm. or whatever kind of technique you, you made use of. Do you think um, they, I mean, we know they're going away a bit, right? Um, well, yeah, perhaps as techniques, but perha not perhaps. Some of them are techniques that enable stuff that they, they will for, for sure go away, I, I would say. But mm. in, in some respect, there are uh, means to their own end, like named entities, for instance. If you want to see how many times... Uh, Facebook were you know, referenced by you know CEO or, or Zuckerberg or, or mm. Facebook in in a, in a in a stream of news. You might still want to extract those. Do you think name entity recognition will still keep on, so to speak? Maybe uh, yes, I, I believe. But the techniques for getting at them will be different yeah. or are different. Yeah. Mm, <coughs> interesting topic. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm biting my tongue a bit, but yeah, that's uh, it sounds, sounds. But that's like okay. So that's not what we're working with at Rice. We are, I think, we're more aligned with what you are thinking, uh, mm -hmm. like representation learning and, yes. and doing semantic search and stuff like that. But but after university, wh where did we go? Where did you go from here? Uh, I went to the Swedish Institute of Computer Science in pure Swedish six, uh, where I worked for for dozens uh, dozens of years or one dozen of years while I was doing my PhD. Uh, so working full time and, and doing the PhD at the same time is, you know, end up taking some time. So that, yeah. that's what I did. And you must have been a colleague with Lale, who has uh, been known on the exactly, podco exactly, podcast exactly. show yes. earlier, guest. Yes. But you worked in different... We were in different departments then. Uh, but then it sort of reconverged uh, in, in the, when we started at the same day, I, I, I believe, in uh, Recorded Future. Mm. Oh, which yeah. was then a small startup. I think he and I were number eight or nine uh, on the... What year was so this? who was first? <laughs> I, I, I believe he was. <laughs> what year was this? Uh, 2010. 10. Yeah. And then I, from what I've heard, they're like in the 400s of people now. And they sold the company last year for $750 million or something. Yeah. And if you were to describe what Recorded Future does. Well, what we did back then, uh, I think back then was different from what they're doing right now. Yeah. So they pivoted in a successful way, I would say. Back then we were working with... 
uh, essentially named entities and you know and and temporal refer referential expressions like for is is are we talking about today or tomorrow or, or last week or when we say uh, q1 next year what what do we mean and and they did uh, like a big database of this so you could you can essentially uh, query the database and and like this let me know about any rumored ipos in southeast east asia in q2 next year mm. and they would have that information uh, but now they're working, uh, this is, that that was about the time when I, when I left them. But now, as far as I understand, they're working more, more with threats and, and threat intelligence. Yeah, uh, that's a big um, body for that, for sure. Yeah. And, and it's certainly needed these days, uh, mm. no question about mm. that. But you also moved into Gavagai, mm. right? Yes. Uh, and how did that happen? Can you just describe the history there a bit? Yes, uh, Magnus Algren and Jussi Algren uh, created, uh, started the company Gavagai in 28, I think, 2008. And then they hired me and two of my, two of our four former colleagues in 2011, 2010, I think. And from the start, it was like a more of a technical uh, company. We were building things that were based on Magnus and Jus's uh, research. Mm. Uh, it was actually embeddings before embeddings were cool and it was so long ago so you know map reduce weren't it wasn't a thing back then so we rolled our own thing uh and you know um, so what did embeddings mean at that time it wasn't word embeddings in terms of word to vec kind no, of style no. it was something else more, what was more it? it was based on uh, on the research on random indexing so it's essentially account based uh i, I i'm sure i will hear from Mangi about this later on but <laughs> <laughs> account-based uh, method for for actually getting embeddings uh, from random seeds uh, of words uh, and then you can get uh, different types of relations there you can get the paradigmatic relations that is the substitution of things mm -hmm. so you could get synonymity and antonymity uh, words that mean the same mm -hmm. and you can also get the syntagmatic relations like things are following uh, and that we could use for different things. And what was the main uh, applications or use cases? Uh, the first use case uh, is quite different from what they, they or we are actually doing now because I'm still uh, a part of the company. <clears throat> the first one was, was uh, social media monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, my responsibility was to, to find data providers, get the data integrated into our system and, and, and make sure we had a steady flow of tweets and blog posts and news and such. Uh, so I think at, at the peak, we processed, I think, around 10, 10 to 20 million social media posts per day. And who was the typical customer and uh, for what purpose? Uh, well, mostly to keep track on like brands, if people are, are talking, because uh, on, on this as well, we built uh, sentiment. Sentiment analysis, yeah. I was thinking about yeah. that. Yeah. So but it turns out that sentiment analysis is, is not something you can actually act on. I mean, you can say you, you can see you, you have a timeline and you have your your brand, and, and and suddenly the negativity goes up. Well, why? What does it mean? So that's when when we started uh, working more with topics and so on. And this is why where Gavagai is today is more <clears throat> like a, like a, to put it simply, it's like an interactive topic model. So you could actually pour in your data if you're a company, and you could slice and dice the data and understand uh, what people are talking about if they're happy or not, or what kind of different sentiments there are if, if, uh, if people are talking about your products. So basically you, you moved into more and more thinking what is actionable for the customer. Yes, yes, and then basically yes. sentiment <clears throat> is good, but we can do it better. Yes, if you couple it with something else, it's, it could be useful. So if you have topics and sentiment and you have a time. I need to connect you with someone. Yeah. We'll take that offline. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> but you say topic modeling, and do you mean the, the classical type no. of unsupervised topic no, modeling? Or no, something no else? that's not really actionable because okay. that, there are too many knobs to tweak. And, yeah. and you can get, it's, it's more like, as far as I understand, it's more like a biased thing. I want to achieve this and I turn my knobs until I get this. Mm -hmm. uh, my, I might be misunderstanding something here, but and that's not the way we're doing it at Gavagai. Um, Gavagai's methods are based more on, on terms and term frequency. And, and one other thing that the, the system also learns is, is engrams, like sequences of words that are mm -hmm. prominent in the language. So it could pick up things um, like President Barack Obama or, or 
whatever precedent there are there is. But but <coughs> can you if you just elaborate a bit more? So if it's not unsupervised topic modeling, mm. you know, basically having a set of text and, and then trying to get come up with a set of topics that are mm. different in, in some way, clustering in some way. Yes, yes, yes. It's a, uh, it's a combination of, of, of topic modeling and clustering, I would say. But, so your approach is more that, is it more that you can actually specify some kind of topic that you want to have? So it's like more semi-supervised or purely mm. supervised approach or how well, would you describe it? Well, I'm not really opera operational in the company, but I would describe it as if you it's like an exploration. You can you could have your data and you can explore. So slice and dice kind of interactive. Yes, exactly. Yeah, oh, exactly. Okay. And you can do it once, and then when you've done it, you have a model of your your world, in a, so to mm -hmm. speak. And then you can do it over and over again. So next time, if you have th three thousand new emails from from angry customers next week, you can apply the same model, and you can see what has happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's quite successful, actually. Is it used together with sort of traditional MPS methodologies yes. and? Yes. Uh, uh, CSI approaches. So, so a CSI, I'm not familiar, familiar and, with. And, and, and yeah, old school MPS is ruling yeah. the world right now no. in this area. I mean, yeah. like it's net promoter score. Yes, yes. So uh, actually, I, I think they see quite a lot of NPS questions. Yeah. yeah. We, we just had a project recently about trying to have, if you take the traditional type of top modeling, which is unsupervised, mm -hmm. but usually based on TIF, IDF, this mm -hmm. kind of you know term frequency and statistical approaches, and then trying to move it a bit more to <laughs> a bit more to uh, the semantical type of understanding that word yes. embeddings <coughs> or especially these kind of bird based approaches mm. today have and uh, we just have a, like a semantical topic modeling mm. project uh, wh what do you think about that do, do you think um, i think it's the way to go yeah uh, i'm i'm curious how you manage to get the um, the topics, I mean, in context, when you do things with BERT or, or yes. any other transformer model, you have like the whole sequence encoded. I, I'd love to, to yeah. talk about that <laughs> in detail. But, uh, but that before we go it. there, <laughs> let's finish the first story. Yes. Of, uh, Thank uh, you, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it is not easy, yeah. but there are ways to do it. But let's um, park that one. This yeah, is yeah. cool stuff. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so Gava Guy, and you worked there, and, and they did a lot of uh, very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know the company as well from before, and Magnus Solgren, mm -hmm. who is your colleague, yes, and, yes. and still is today, I guess, in yeah. Rise, etc. How did you move from Gavagai? Uh, was it into Rise directly? Was no, it I went to the Swedish Defense Research Agency first. Right. So mm. what happened was, uh, this was before BERT, because I remember that October morning by the coffee machine when the BERT paper was released, but this was prior to that. Mm. Um, I realized I was working, I, I really loved it to Gavagai. It's a great place to be. Uh, my best years in, in, in work life so far has been there, um, in that place. but. Eventually, I understood that well, I mean, we were building a product here. We, we went essentially from technology readiness level uh, one or two, which is academic research, to eight or nine, which is a product. Mm -hmm. and, and having a product and making that journey from, from one, two to eight, nine is it's challenging it's and it's, it's cool. But when you are at eight, nine, there are different uh, prior priorities. I mean, you have to there, there's support, you have to have uptime, uh, service level agreements and everything like that. So, and I realized my field, I was working more or less like a software engineer back end and, um, and also talking to clients and, and pre-sales and everything. And it's a small company, everyone does everything. Mm -hmm. But I realized that something is happening to my field, the, the, the seismic shift of neural networks. I mean, they were applied once in, in the 80s, 80s and 90s and they were quite uncool for some time. And Winter, then yes, back. Yeah, yeah. And spring. <laughs> uh, and I realized I, I, I want to be on that train, but to be that, I couldn't be at a, a product company. I had to switch. So Back to research. Yes. And then can, I, can you just yeah. uh, you know, elaborate a bit more? Why couldn't you be at a product company? Because product companies are busy doing product things. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess there are a couple of points. I have very few data points on this, but as far as I understand, I, I will not name names, but there are companies mm -hmm. you can pivot when you're young as a company and you can make your, your, your text selections then. But once you do it, it's going to be a lot of time and a lot of money before you can actually undo those changes. But I think this is uh, such an interesting. We should, move, we should move into okay. this topic later. No, we have. We, we, know, no. we know <laughs> this is the whole pivoting and when to do it. Yeah. Actually, uh, I, I, I want to this. elaborate on your level one to nine product mm. model. What's what's what are you referring to? Mm. 
who's, who's model. Mm. This is really, really good mm. and cool stuff that people need to think about carefully. You clearly had, are doing it on a daily basis with this, but also mm. how you think in rice that you work up to a certain level, yep. but yep. not the rest. Mm. This is a topic in its own that is mm. super cool. Mm. So yeah. two, two good topics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think let's unpack more. Let's unpack. The, the, mm. quos- the question about, you know, mm. companies that are more product related, mm. like Spotify or Galagai mm. or whatnot. Um, I think it's super important for them to be innovative. Mm. And it is hard for mm. sure, but it's very important that they do that. And I agree. And and there's always an explanation. I mean, but and in our case, I think it was the timing. Mm. So it, we, built, we built our own stack. And then to undo that, it would take time to adopt new technology. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Oof. Wow, so many good talk. stuff, yeah. topics. Well, can we, can we add another hour? <laughs> <laughs> I'm free tonight, so sure. <laughs> okay, so Galagai, um, but then you move into the Swedish Defense Agency, I guess yes. we can call it. And uh, can you just talk a bit about that? Or is it all secret? Or how it's, much not, it's not really secret. It's a, it, it's a cool place. You do, they do research for the purpose of, of keeping Sweden safe, in a sense, yeah. and different, different, uh, different um, areas. And, and the, the particular area I was working in had to do with information, textual information. So mm. I did one job uh, where we looked at uh, how people online in different forums, like Flashback and such, uh, talked about journalists mm. uh, in what way, if there were derogatory comments or, or, or hateful comments and such. And we quantify that in some way and, and put out a report. To, to so, sort of shed light on that And problem. to what purpose? I mean, why do you understand if they talked about journalists in some well, way? Well, this particular project was actually commissioned by one of the uh, one one of the organizations that that sort of helps uh, journalists, and, and it's also, of course, for democracy and yeah. being able to speak up and, and not be be afraid. And and one way of actually putting a light on it is to measure it, yeah. because then we can actually see if something are changing. And I'm just curious, in what way is this organization? placed in the defense uh, uh, it's, it's ecosystem, an, it's or a, I, I don't know what to call it. It's a, it's a myndighet. Uh, okay, it's a myndighet. Yeah, so it's a, it's a um, well, they do different kinds of research, essentially. But uh, so they're not part of military and as such, it's actually, it's a statly myndighet. It's, it's, a, it's a government agency. Government agency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. And and then you worked there for for some years. No, six months. <laughs> uh, that's this this is some um, uh, having to do with expectation expectation management. So yeah. I switched from Gavagai to do the research, and it turned out um, the the projects I sort of faced there was not really the ones that I, I wanted to do work with. So instead of hanging the hanging in there and trying to fix it. Um, uh, I just I, th- I figured I, I need to move on. So I was already moving on in a sense since I was quitting after mm. seven years of, of one one job. Mm. So great people. Was the lack of innovation or was the lack of uh, wrong topics for you? I guess. Uh, was it the, the the, I think it was yeah the context and also uh, f- yes f- without you know saying too much. I think the view of science mm. was different. Yeah. Okay. So cool. in this sense, interesting. So that moved you mm. into rice, yes. Then, I guess. <coughs> yes. And for people that don't know what rice is, how would you describe that? Ooh, rice is a. Now we're quite a big place. I think we are two thousand eight hundred people in it. So it's essentially a an organization comprised of all technical research institutes in Sweden. So we do pretty much every, everything. Mm. Uh, I found our logotype on plastic bags. I saw a big trailer with, tri- with, with cars having our logotype on it. So we do everything from, from, uh, from, from um, uh, you know, testing masks uh, so, so they are safe for COVID to, um, to computer science. Stoltens proving some stuff yes. is part of RICE yes. as an example, just yes. to highlight that yeah. you are really doing a lot of different things. Yeah. That's true. But did you start at six first and yes. then into rice? Or so so six is uh, six is actually morphed into to rice now. Yeah. So, so this um, was at what year approximately? Uh, actually, two and a half years ago. And then uh, rice restructured. Was it last two years ago? Yeah, it's pretty much the same. From from I I actually went in there you on caused on, that uh, yes, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, no, but I was employed in under a new contract, and, and my colleagues had this old one still. So it was in the middle of the transition. Mm. You were really starting in the transition yes. period. Yes. Yeah. 
So everything up in the air and then starting to exactly, structure it down. Exactly. Classic. So there's a lot of opportunity to just do things, which is good. Mm. And uh, you know, I worked a lot with Six as well. And what does it stand for? Swedish Institute of Computer Science, or mm. what's yeah? yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was then you know integrated into Rice, and they became a common unit, so to speak. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So so exactly where in Rice are you now? Uh, oh, let's see if I remember the org chart. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think the division is called digital systems, and then uh, the subdivision is called computer science. And in that is a group called intelligent systems, and there's our group called natural language understanding, which is like an informal uh, group. And you call it natural language understanding yes. instead of processing? Yes. Is that the point to that? Or yes. <laughs> can you describe the differences? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it is. It is in a sense. I mean, natural language processing is is like a larger scope. Uh, you could do named entities, for instance, there. But the understanding part is more, since this Magnus Salgren, who's who's leading the group, and he's also ha- has a degree in philosophy, so he's really keen on the language philosophy thing and actually trying things out in models. So I think it's it's from there actually it stems. So it's more like representation learning and 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 getting these magnificent models to do things that we barely believe are, are possible. Uh, so it's more about that and then trying to use that because since RISE is an applied research institute, uh, we essentially have two interfaces towards our clients. One is research and one is innovation. Uh, and if you work in innovation, you take the things we do in research in natural language understanding and do, then you apply it to, to, to whatever information needs and or, or uh, use cases they have. So when you say that this piece of rice, you can actually commission rice as a consultant, like mm. you would go to any other yes. type of industry consultancy. Yes. yes, that's that's pretty much how it works. Everything is project based. So we, who are researchers, we have our ideas what we want to do, um, and I think we are seven or eight in our group right now, and we have our ideas, and and we find peers that are having the same uh, matching problems. Um, or research ag- agendas, and then we work with them. Like Peltarian, for instance, we have lots of things in common, I think, yeah, I think given so, the, yeah. the projects we have. Yeah. And for people that still don't really understand, like RISE is a re- research institute, mm. uh, by, by definition, um, but universities uh, are as well moving, mm. I would argue, at least, uh, towards more and more yeah. applied research yeah. in some <coughs> way. Uh, can If you were to try to still Describe the differences between working as a researcher in your university compared to Rice. What would you say the differences? Um, well, maybe I'm. Well, if you're in a university, maybe you have the uh, opportunity to think more freely and you know, uh, open spaces, think about you know interesting stuff, and then you th- do things that that is not really useful until someone else come up, comes up with this other thing in 20 years and then you can merge them and do something. Mm-hmm. RISE is more applied, so you, you you don't have that horizon. Everything is guided by the needs. Uh, I mean, the purpose of RISE is to do to be some some uh, catalyst for Sweden in digitization mm-hmm. and, and in AI and machine learning in our case. Mm-hmm. So we really have to have like a stakeholder that, that's willing to accept some things um, down the ro- down the road, maybe two or three years ago. I mean, or, or way like like the language model Swebert uh, project, mm. where we are building a language model for Swedish, uh, and then try to deploy it to 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 whatever whoever wants to use it. That's a research project which has as goal to actually build something that we could could be picked up. Yeah, by industry, and I think we should have that as a separate topic about mm. Svebert and, and speak a bit more about what we do there because it's a big and very important. Yeah, it's it's uh, an topic. important <coughs> initiative, but still, I th- mm. I'm, I'm really trying to to think, you know, how how we should phrase this properly. Uh, I've been in universities as well after yeah. a PhD mm. and worked as a researcher in university as well, <coughs> and there are pros and cons, of course, mm. in in working. You know, for one in industry completely and in academia completely, mm. or in research institutes completely. I mean, it, there there is there are pros and cons mm. with each. How do you see the How do you see the pros and cons? <laughs> they should be <laughs> <Thank you>. com- <laughs> they should be complementary. I think the pros and cons. 
Well, okay, let me phrase it like this. Yes. Uh, that there is one thing, you know, what universities are today and mm. how it works mm. and how, to, how you have to apply for funding mm. all the time to, to get the re research grant you, you need to mm. do the work you need. But in your view, what <clears throat> would be the best way to say that this is what the universities should do, this is the, the way RICE should do, this is the way industry should do research? Wow, I don't know. I, I can't answer that. I mean, it's been so long since I was at the university. Mm. Um, from what I see from within RICE, which is of course ridden with confirmation bias, is that we are doing the right thing. We have we have peers that are keen on what we're doing. We are we are constantly doing improvements or changes to what we actually do and what our research to sort of accommodate. There's a push and pull. Like mm. they say they want this and we try to fix this and we tell them you should look at this in this direction. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, there's a... There's a healthy di dialogue. Yes. I think so. I Bottom line, I mean, like you have, you can stretch them, yeah. but then they can pull you back. Mm. This is what we need now. Yeah. yeah, but you should think about this. And yeah. this is a constant dialogue. And I think right now in our field uh, for, for an NLP and so on, there's a need for education. I mean, people or organization need to be aware of what they should ask for, what they could do. Yeah, what could the do. art of possible. Mm. Uh, we, they don't know. No, exactly. I think th this is a great segue into potentially the next topic. And, and unless we, we have some other part of um, the the career part no. that you're in, I mean, you're in RISE now yeah. and you're working with yeah. NLP and you're, you're, formal you're a senior research scientist, yeah. right? Yeah. So the, the last question is, what are you working on right now? What's your daily job all about Ooh. at RISE? Oh, my daily job is to juggle meetings in Zoom, Teams <laughs> and Google Hangouts. Welcome to the club, <laughs> yeah. No, but there's a mixture of, of projects. Uh, I am heavy on the innovation project side, so I'm working with Together with clients. Yes, with exactly. Clients. So, yeah. and two of them are actually with, with, uh, with agencies that are um, if we translate this to English, it's, it commends your AI journey. So it, it's, uh, they have received funding um, from Binova to uh, start with small projects to get going. Uh, this first few steps on their AI startup uh, frame, you know, approach. Yeah, exactly. And this is for, there were actually two different calls. One of them were for commercial entities and one is for, for public agencies. So this is for public agencies. And then there's a two, two, two kinds of goals in each project is one is to do something for them with their data and their needs. And the other one is to help them get educated. And typically do you then based on this Vinova call, we mm. had Vinova, we have yeah. Daniel from Vinova, so we mm. have under explained the call, yeah. but based on this call now, is this basically where let's say the public sector, an agency together with RISE yes. is answering on the call and gets funding yes. from Vinova yes. to work mm. on a, get started with AI project. Exactly. exactly. And uh, RISE is one part of it. It could be other actors yeah. as well doing it. Mm. So I work uh, um, quite a lot with that. And we have some other agencies working that we work with. And there's also uh, new things coming in all the time.